I got a little chatter for you. You're gonna love this one. A paranoid Hi, schizophrenic a walks into a bar. bar. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. And today is Mob Movie Monday. Got a great one for you today. It's the movie Legend about the Cray brothers, the Cray twins, uh, who uh, were based out of London uh, in the United Kingdom. Great movie. If you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. But before we get to that, a couple of announcements. Uh, my book, Blood Covenant, that we've been out of stock on since um, I think around Christmas time, we finally got them in. So if you're interested in the book, you can go on, you know, Facebook or you can go on uh, Instagram or there's links at the bottom here. You can go to the store. Yes, I sign it for you. We don't use a stamp. I sign every one of them. So I had a lot of books over the last 20 some odd years. But this book, Blood Covenant, is the, um, uh, the book that uh, my life story made into a television series is based upon this book. So you may want to pick it up. I've been getting a lot of requests lately for it. So that's that. And there's other products on there, too. So that's that. Uh, we're into the month of March. Uh, great. You know, maybe we get near the end of this pandemic. You know, we heard conflicting things about that, but I think it's coming to a close. The vaccine is out there. Hopefully we're going to be start uh, getting back to what uh, our normal life is all about. So we'll see about that. So the movie Legend, you know, um, I never really watched this movie. Uh, for some reason, I was always interrupted during my time watching it, but I got a chance to to watch it last night. And you know what? Terrific film. Tom Hardy plays both brothers, Reggie and Ronnie. He did a masterful job. The only problem I had with the movie was sometimes with Ronnie Cray's accent. It's heavy London type of accent. And I had a little trouble sometimes picking up on it. But other than that, it was a brilliant film. And just an overall summary of it. I liken this film quite a bit to Chicago during the Capone era. Now, this was London during the 1960s, around that time. But the Cray brothers kind of reminded me of Capone and the same operation in some ways. And as I get into the movie, I, as you get into the movie, too, I think you'll see that. But really, a brilliant film, a little bit different than a lot of the other uh, mob um, movies that are out there. It had a real intense love story, a sad story, as a matter of fact, but a real intense love story in it. The brothers, I've never seen characters like both of them. They're very, very unique. And sometimes we forget, but uh, this is not the mafia, but it is organized crime. They were a gang. They were gangsters. And these kind of uh, criminal operations exist all over the world, really, in just about every country. And uh, so this one is, is a great one. So watch the movie. I guess it's on Netflix. Uh, I watched it on a different format last night, but uh, pick it up and watch it. You're going to enjoy it. So how does the film open up? Interesting. Opens up in London again, 1960s. And we see Reggie Cray, who is the more sane. And that's, that's kind of putting it lightly. The more sane of the two brothers. Um, he's walking in the street and he's under surveillance from two detectives, uh, two, you know, London detectives. And he walks up to them and he offers them a cup of coffee uh, and donuts or whatever it is they offer them. And it made me laugh a little bit because when I was under a surveillance, my dad was under surveillance, same thing. We had these poor guys sitting down in a car for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, waiting for us to do something. So every once in a while, we'd offer them coffee, maybe a donut, you know, got to talk to them because some of them were decent guys. They were doing their job. And so uh, they didn't like Reggie. You could see that right off the bat. He was being a little bit of a smart ass with them and, and they kind of responded the same way. But that's how the film opens up. And then shortly after that, we see Reggie walking over to, um, uh, to meet one of his guys, I think his driver, and uh, his sister opens the door. And that uh, is the uh, young lady, her name is Frances, that does become the love of Reggie's life. And the kind of love story for the film starts there. You can see there's an attraction between the two of them. 
right away. And as the movie develops, the love story develops. And uh, it, it turned out to be a sad one, but uh, it was a, kind of a thread throughout the whole movie. And actually, this woman, Frances, she does the uh, voiceover throughout the film. She's kind of telling the story. And you know, voiceovers could be very effective if they're done the right way. You know, I'll just give you a little hint. In the industry, people normally don't like to do voiceovers. They say it's kind of a shortcut rather than showing, you know, the film uh, itself. But if it's done the right way, like it was done in Goodfellas, if you remember, Henry Hill did the voiceover. It was great. If you do it in the right way, it's great. It was also done in Casino, a couple of movies. So some people really know how to do it well, some of the writers. So in here, I thought it was done well, too. So the film develops. You start to learn a little bit about Reggie Cray. He's got kind of his gang. And uh, what he's into there, the criminal activity he's into there, extortion and things like that, kind of normal stuff. He also owns a nightclub and uh, he's also into gambling a little bit, that kind of a thing. And um, him and Francis get together at one point and uh, they go meet his brother, Ronnie. Now, let me tell you about Ronnie. Ronnie is definitely insane. He's certifiable, no doubt about it. You can see that throughout the film. And he actually went to prison for something, I think it was manslaughter. After he was convicted, they put him in a psychiatric home because he was insane. Well, what happens, he starts meeting with the psychiatrist who knows that he's certifiable, but Reggie arranges to basically threaten the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist gives a good report uh, to the government, and they allow Ronnie out on the street. The psychiatrist then meets with Reggie later on and says, I know what you did. You got to me. I'm scared for my life. Basically, that's what he's telling him in, in some and substance. He said, but your brother's nuts. He's, he's definitely insane. He needs medication. Reggie kind of just pushes it off. So you know right off the bat, Ronnie is uh, you know, a troublesome kind of guy. And uh, these are very violent guys, really violent guys, and uh, both of them. And uh, you know, as the story develops, you see that between the two of them. So we do see a scene when, uh, I think it's their first date, when uh, Reggie and Francis are in his nightclub and Reggie gets called over by some of his guys to meet with somebody that owes some money, and they're talking about it a little bit, and Reggie makes this guy know, you know, come back to work, pay us the money that you owe us. He gets up, like everything is fine, then boom, he hits him in the mouth, you know, so you know right away, Reggie means business. And then somebody says uh, some pro profane word, some profanity, and as Reggie's walking away, he says, hey, I told you, don't use profanity in my nightclub. What, you know? But uh, it was a funny scene, kind of shows you a different side of Reggie. The next scene is when we really get introduced to Ronnie. And Reggie and Francis are going to this trailer park or trailer that's in the middle of nowhere, and Ronnie walks out of the trailer. And again, you know that he's certifiable. You can see it in his eyes. I mean, you just see it. And um, he's sitting down with Francis. Uh, Reggie goes into the trail for something, and Ronnie starts to talk to Francis. He introduces himself. Yeah, and during the conversation, Ronnie felt it important to let Francis know that he was a homosexual. His boyfriend actually walks out of the trailer. And it's interesting uh, what he says. He says, hey, I think it's important that we are honest about you know, who we really are. And he says that. So. Um, and then the conversation moves on. Next scene, Reggie is uh, walking in the street, and boom, somebody hits him with a car, and we find out that that's a rival gang. There is a rival gang. They're called the Torture Gang, actually. And we see a scene where this torture gang um, is actually torturing somebody. It's a gruesome scene, you know, kind of, they got a guy hanging up and they're punching him and electrocuting him and everything else. So we find out that there's two rival gangs in London. There's the Cray and then the, the Crays and then there's the torture gang. And so that's kind of sets up what's going on, the organized crime activity in London at that time. Shortly after that, uh, the rival gang, they send some people over to, um, uh, the craze social club or bar or restaurant and they say we want to have a truce so they talk about having a truce we see Ronnie saying we don't want no truce and you know they have a conversation and they uh, arrange to have a meeting and uh, at that meeting they're going to arrange for the truce between the two gangs well the truce ends up being a setup and the rival gang uh, was really looking to set up the two craze they were going to give them a beating in the club and Ronnie shows a little bit of his crazy side. He gets upset. He walks out of the club. And Reggie's in there by himself. 
and Reggie is calling out the other 10 guys from the rival gang that are in there. It's really cool the way he does it. Tells them what to go and where to go and all this kind of stuff. And they're about to, in their view, you know, really kick his ass. They're going after him. Well, Ronnie slips back into the club. He's got a ball peen hammer in his hand and boom, a fight ensues. And the two Craig twins end up devastating all of these guys. They really beat them up. It's a gruesome scene. They knock them out, right? It's unbelievable. And from what, I'm, what I hear about the Craigs, and I'm going to get into that a little bit because I have a little you know, inside information about them, uh, this is true. They were violent uh, brothers. They really were. Ronnie was crazy. Reggie was a tough guy, no doubt about it. And this is how they operated. So they just about leveled at that point that rival gang. That was it. And uh, they kind of established themselves as the two guys in London. Next scene, we find out uh, they have a guy like Roy Cohn, a guy by the name of Payne. His last name is Payne. He's kind of like an attorney type, a barrister, they call him in, in London. And uh, there is a scene there where the Crays want to buy a gambling club. It's called the Esmeralda Club. And uh, the owner of the club comes in, he sits down with Payne. Payne says, we're going to make you an offer you can't refuse, basically. He says, I don't want to sell the club. And Payne says, look, we can do this the nice way or we can do it the hard way. The Cray twins are sitting in the back. The guy gets the message. He sells the club. So now they own the Esmeralda Club, which is a, a great place, a uh, gambling operation. So they established themselves in that regard. They got a nightclub, and the Crays are starting to really come up in London. They have established themselves as the guys there. Okay, so what happens now? We hear that my old organization, the mob, wants to move in on London. And Meyer Lansky uh, obviously took notice of what the Crays were doing in London. They are, have established themselves in Vegas during this time, and now they want to move to London. So they send a representative there, who happens to be Chaz Palminteri, to meet with the Cray brothers and offer them a deal. And basically they have a sit down over it and uh, they make a deal during that time where um, they're gonna go partners. And uh, I think Chaz was representing Lansky and Luciano and that group there. They make a deal and Chaz tells them we're gonna go 60-40, we'll put up the money. Reggie Cray says, no, we're gonna go 50-50, we're partners, we're not working for you, we're working together. And Chaz kind of likes it, and he says, okay, let's do it. Ronnie gets off a little bit, says some silly things, but Chaz uh, enjoys it. And anyway, they make a deal. So the mob's always got to get involved. When we see a buck anywhere in the world, we're in on it, if we can possibly be. And, you know, Mylansky did do a lot of things in Europe, and he had gambling operations all over the world, and so he was involved with the Cray brothers there. They did make a deal, and they moved forward. Now things start to get heavy between um, Francis and Reggie. And Francis, um, you know, in many respects, she's a good girl. She, she doesn't want Reggie in criminal activity. She wants him to go straight. Uh, Reggie has a problem. He had an old warrant against him. And it turns out that he's got to do some time in jail. Not a lot, I think six months or a year, whatever it might have been. And uh, he promises Francis that when he comes out of jail, he's going to go straight. He's not going to fool around, not going to do anything wrong, because she's not into that. She doesn't want it. She loves him. I mean, you can see the love story really developing, and she wants him to come straight. And by the way, this is based upon a true story. I don't know if I said that in the beginning, but it is based upon a true story. So Reggie ends up turning himself in. He gets into the prison, and bad day for him. The guards are well aware of him. They don't like him. After they check him in and they process him, they bring him into a corridor, a hall, and they beat him up. And they beat him up bad. Like five or six guards gave him a real, real beating. They drag him into his cell. You see that he's all bloody. He's lying on the ground and he's on the floor in the this, in this cell. And he tells the, uh, the guard, I need water. I need water. And the guard is kind of harassing him. Oh, here's the big shot, Reggie Cray, begging me for a cup of water. So he goes and gets the water. And he brings it over to the cell. It's a great scene. Brings it over to the cell. Unbeknownst to him, during the beating, Reggie had grabbed his handcuffs. And when the guard puts his hand in there to hand him the water, Reggie puts the handcuff on him and handcuffs him, both hands, to the cell. And then starts beating him up. Takes his, his billy club and starts hitting him over the head. He gives the guard a beating. That's it. You know, great scene. So again, real tough guy. No doubt about it. 
So he's doing his time. He sees uh, Francis in prison on a visit, and he promises her again, you know, we're going to go straight. He really does love her. You could see it. The love story is really developed. So now Reggie finishes his time, and he comes out, and he goes back to his club, and he finds out that Ronnie has basically ran the club into the ground. He's destroyed. He doesn't know how to run a business. The guy's insane, right? How's he going to run a club? But everybody's afraid of him. So they don't want to tell him, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. He runs it into the ground. Reggie goes in there on a Friday night. There's nobody in there. There was a scene before this where uh, Ronnie grabbed the microphone when the club was crowded and he starts talking to the audience saying all of these nonsense things like he's a gangster. Everybody in the club is like, who is this guy? They're afraid of him. Anyhow, he runs it into the ground. Reggie is very, very upset. They're in the, in the club together. Reggie is yelling at Ronnie. Ronnie yells back at him. I think Ronnie says something, you know, disparaging about Francis. And uh, Reggie hits him. Anyway, they have a huge fight in the club. Two brothers, right? They really go at it. And a uh, huge, huge, huge fight. At the end of the day, um, Ronnie gets the worst of it. Reggie kind of beats him up. Ronnie gets the worst of it. But, you know, Reggie got it too. But Ronnie got the worst of it. And he's on the ground, and you think that these two are never going to get together again, like it's over with between them. But Reggie's got a sore spot, still loves his brother, and they do get back into a relationship together. So now we have Ronnie again in some crazy scene, and, and this is true, by the way. He's meeting with somebody because he wants money to open up some kind of a business deal that he has in Nigeria, a legitimate deal because this is gonna give him recognition. It's kind of uh, you know, something that he really wants to do, but he needs a lot of money to do it. And he approaches one of these uh, politicians that he knows through his uh, homosexual friend, you know, his boyfriend, his relationship. And uh, he's trying to get money out of him, basically to build something in Nigeria that would be good for his image. And he's hell-bent on this. This is what he wants to do. That kind of develops throughout the story. Anyway, the brothers get busted again. And uh, through a series of events, they're able to set up the government in such a way that they're able to basically bribe their way out of uh, getting convicted in the case. The case gets dismissed. It was a whole extortion case. The case gets dismissed. And that kind of really establishes the craze as the go-to gangsters in London. And we see a scene there when this guy Payne, who I liken to Roy Cohen, he was kind of the fixer and he was the legitimate guy in the operation that does things for the Cray brothers, mainly for Reggie, because Ronnie didn't like him right off the bat. Ronnie had tried to get 50,000 pounds out of him, money, uh, to put up this thing in Nigeria. Uh, you know, Payne wouldn't give him the money, said he didn't have the money because he had run the club into the ground. This was before Reggie had gotten out on his last beef. And so uh, Ronnie didn't like Payne at all. We see another scene where Payne is telling the two brothers, look, you guys got to stop with the violence. You got to establish yourself as business guys. You got to stop it because this is going to lead to nowhere. Ronnie gets disgusted with him, says, hey, we're gangsters. That's who we are. You know, and uh, finally, Ronnie, like he's had it, he picks up a glass, he throws it at Payne, smashes the side of his head. Payne runs out of the place. Reggie and Ronnie clash again. You know, Ronnie says to his brother Reggie, this guy knows too much about us. If anything happens, he's going to turn snitch. He's going to send us to jail. Reggie says, hey, everybody in the place knows about us. We got this guy picking up money for us. We got this guy paying off cops. You want to kill everybody? You want to throw everybody out? You know, Reggie's like, you know, what are you, crazy? You know, he's working with us. We can't worry about all of these guys. They're part of our team. And they clash again. The brothers are constantly clashing now, all the time. So as the story develops, um, you know, the love story part continues to go with Francis and Reggie. Reggie wants to marry Francis. Francis says, if you go straight, if you don't get convicted on this case or any other case, I'll marry you. And, but that's a condition. He's got to stay straight. He's got to get out of the criminal lifestyle. Reggie promises that he will. They do get married. And uh, supposedly things are going well. Ronnie goes off his rocker again. Um, he's going after the rival gang guy. I think the guy, his name was George. Uh, he makes a deal with somebody. He says, you give me 2,000 pounds, somebody that this guy George, you know, from the torture gang had roughed up. Ronnie tells him in a scene, you give me 2,000 pounds, I'll kill George for you. Guy agrees. Ronnie now goes into a club, 
George's club, George is sitting at the bar, Ronnie walks in, there's six, seven, eight witnesses there, walks right up to George, George is kind of sneering at him, Ronnie puts a bullet in his head, George is gone, in front of everybody, everybody's seen it, right, he's got witnesses all over the place. So, Reggie finds out about it, next scene we see Ronnie over at their mom's house, and the mom is taking care of Ronnie, he's eating there, Reggie comes in and says, are you out of your mind? You shoot this guy in front of seven witnesses. You're going to go to jail. Ronnie is like, you know, again, he's certifiable. He had to do it, you know, whatever. And so Reggie now is, getting que is questioning Ronnie so he can find out what happened so Reggie can try to fix it. Got to get to the people that were in the bar. Got to silence them. He's planning this whole thing. Tells Ronnie, look, tell me everything that happened that night. What clothes were you wearing? Where was the gun? Because Reggie wants to clean it all up for him. Still their brothers. You could see that they, you know, that, that Reggie felt for him and had the love for his brother. It's really a touching thing, as crazy as it was, that no matter what his brother did, you know, he can hit him, he could beat him up, they could clash, but still it was his brother, and he wants to, uh, you know, he wants to... Uh, uh, help him in any way you can. You know, I kind of relate to my own situation in that regard. My brother, you know, John, who many of you know about, you know, I can't even begin to tell you that the trouble that this kid caused, you know, because of his drug habit more than anything else. And uh, between me and my dad, we had to pull him out of so many jams, so many things that happened. I mean, there's no doubt about it. If he wasn't, you know, my brother, my father's son, he would have gotten killed. There's no doubt about it, but we always went to bat for him. We always tried to help him in every which way. In the end, you know the story, he turned on my father. He became an informant, joined the government, put my father back in prison. But you know what? I still love him. He's my brother. And, uh, you know, I know what he grew up. It was a tough, you know, situation in our household with my father being in prison, you know, my mother being a little bit crazy. We, we grew up under some very, very difficult conditions. It really impacted my brother, really impacted my sister, who ended up dying of, a, of an overdose of drugs. You know, my younger sister wasn't, you know, all there at times, you know, she just, she just mentally, she just didn't mature properly, emotionally the same thing. So I kind of understand, you know, but even though your family member can hurt you in such a way and cause you so much problem, problems, you know, there's that, that love between it. And I love my brother now too. I don't agree with the things he did, but I love him. And you know, we are talking now. I hadn't talked to my brother for 10 years, but we are speaking now. I haven't seen him in a long time, but we are talking and I still feel for him. And uh, you know, some people say, well, your brother's this and that, doesn't matter, he's my brother. Same way with my father. You know, I love my father. I don't care what he did in many, many ways. It didn't affect the love that I had for him, the love between us. Just the way it is in family, I'm sure many of you can relate to that. You know, you've had a sister, a brother, a family member, maybe a parent, maybe a child that just drove you crazy. You know, caused you a lot of trouble in your life, but for some reason, that love is there. And I think Reggie felt for Ronnie. He knew, you know, definitely that this guy was not in his right mind. So here now, in a very difficult situation, he does his best to help him out. We see there that their investigation comes in because, again, you know, he killed this guy in front of everybody. The guy's laying on the floor. The cops come in. We do see a scene where um, the barmaid who was in the bar the night that uh, uh, Ronnie shot this guy, um, they bring her to a lineup that Ronnie is in and she's asked to identify the killer. They knew it was Ronnie, the cops did, but they, they had to have a witness. Well, she's uh, uh, you know, looking at everybody and she said, he's not here, she won't identify Ronnie. So obviously Reggie did get to her at that point in time. And now Ronnie's free, at least for, the, for that point in time of that murder. All right, but things are pretty intense now. We're getting you know, near the end of the story and uh, Francis, has kind of had it, you know. She's in the middle of all of this. She sees what's going on with Ronnie and Reggie. She understands the relationship between Reggie and Ronnie, and I think she's at the point where she, she doesn't believe that Reggie is ever going to change. She starts taking drugs, going on pills. She's kind of losing her mind, losing it a little bit, and the relationship is really starting to go downhill. We have a scene there where, uh, where Reggie Cray roughs her up, goes into the house and kind of gets physical and abusive with her because he doesn't like the fact that she's, you know, on pills or doing what she's doing. It's bothering him because, again, he, he does love her. He abuses her, roughs her up a little bit, and she leaves him. 
And we see a scene where she packed her bag, she's walking out, she happens to run into Ronnie out there. They start to talk a little bit. Ronnie walks her to the car. She says, look, I understand the relationship between you and your brother, but she's had it, she's gone. As it moves on, we see that she's really upset about this to the point where she can't live with Reggie, she can't live without him, and um, she plans to kill herself. And um, we see a scene where she's sitting on the bed, taking pill after pill in this apartment, and she does end up committing suicide. And there's a very touching scene for me. Um, her brother, who was one of Reggie's guys, um, uh, lets Reggie into the room. Reggie sees Francis uh, dead in the bed. He's broken up. He sees her lying in the bed. He walks over to where her jewelry is and takes her rings out and puts the rings that he had given her back on her dead fingers. And um, touching scene. I mean, it, it was really sad, their relationship. Francis wanted him to go straight. He just couldn't. She couldn't deal with it. And I can relate to that a little bit, too. I know situations where, you know, women just couldn't take the stuff that was going on you know, with their guys in the mob life. I mean, you know, I put my wife through a lot of difficult situations, eight years in prison, you know, a contract on my life. It's, it's very difficult for the women, you know, to survive in a situation like that and, and really keep their senses. And she just couldn't handle it. I mean, in this case, these guys, you know, Reggie was in and out of trouble, very, very violent. She witnessed a lot of it. It was just too much for her. She couldn't live with him. She couldn't live without him. She took her own life. And by the way, um, in, in real life, she really did. She did commit suicide, I think, two years after uh, Reggie went to prison. Not quite the way it was in the, in the movie, but she did commit suicide. Uh, that's how deeply this affected her. And now, as we get towards the end of the movie, like in every other mob story situation, everybody goes down. Payne becomes a witness. You know, their fixer guy like Roy Cohen, uh, he flips. He uh, joins the government. Many of the guys around the Cray twins, they flip, and the indictments start to come down. Long story short, uh, Ronnie does get indicted for the murder of George, the rival guy, uh, gang guy. Um, he goes to trial. Or I don't know if he goes to trial, but he does get convicted. Uh, but he is insane, and he's put into a mental institution. This time, he can't get himself out of it. And he's in that institution for quite some time until he passed away while in the institution. I think he died of a heart attack in 1995. Reggie ends up uh, for murder and for other things, extortion. He ends up, uh, because he's got all these witnesses that flipped on him, he goes to jail. And uh, I think he gets 30 years. And um, I believe he died in, in the year 2000. Uh, I think they let him out on a compassionate release. And he died shortly after that. You know, it's funny, I, I was thinking, you know, in, uh, in London, in England, you get 30 years for murders and all of that. In, in our country, in America, you get 3,000 years, you know, 300 years for the, for the similar crimes under the Racketeering Act. So, you know, the sentences aren't as severe in Europe, in, in many countries in Europe, as they are here in the United States. Uh, prison conditions might be different, but the sentences, sentencing is light, lighter there. But anyway, it ends like every other mob story ends. Guys going to prison, guys turning informant, you know, women getting the, the, the toughest end of, of all of this stuff. And it always ends bad. And, you know, I always got to say it this way. For any of you young people, I know I have a lot of young people watching my YouTube videos. How do I know that? Because so many of you contact me from all over the world. Michael, I'm doing an assignment. Michael, I'm watching your YouTube videos. Michael, will you help me with an essay? Michael, I'm fascinated with the mafia. I get so many of these comments and messages, and I tell you all the same thing. Crime does not pay in this country or anywhere else. You stay in a life of crime, you surround yourself with the wrong people, you are going to go down. No doubt about it. A lot of people say, well, Michael, you made it. Don't look at me. I am the exception. I am not the rule. I happen to be very blessed. I think God played a major role in my life. I transformed. I became a follower of Christ. Things changed for me. I had a good woman who I'm married to for 37 years almost, okay, that, that helped me transform my life. It's a different situation, but most everybody I know, look at the list. Fortune Magazine, 50 most powerful gangsters, mobsters, whatever you want to call it. Okay, 47 of them are dead in the last 30 years. And many of them died in prison. So, you know, I give you the same message all the time. Crime does not pay. Watch this movie and you'll know that this is not a lifestyle you'll ever want to live. 
Now, I got a little bit of a connection to the craze, and I'm going to tell you how. A couple of years back, I was in England. I was in the United Kingdom, and uh, I had some speaking events there, like 10 of them, as a matter of fact. And we were in London, and we went and stayed in this little section of London called Shortage. And uh, my daughter found this cool hotel. It was me, my wife, and my daughter. She found this great hotel. Uh, it was called the Courthouse. And the reason it was called the Courthouse, because it was the Courthouse at one time in London, and they turned it into a, a great hotel, right? So we stayed there. It was kind of a, you know, a, a real nifty section of, of London. It was really cool. It was like, um, like Greenwich Village kind of thing. You know, it was a really cool section. Loved it. So we're in that hotel, and uh, man, the service was unbelievable. They're treating us like kings. And I said, man, these people are great here. You know, wonderful. And anyway, in one section of the lobby, uh, since this was the courthouse, they had three rooms, and these three rooms were one-time cells. They were holding cells. And in one of the cells, that's where they held the Cray brothers when they were waiting, you know, a case or a trial. And they had all the, you know, paraphernalia and pictures and everything about the Cray brothers in the cell. So I love that stuff. You know, I spent a lot of time looking at it in there. So, yes, I spent time in the same jail cell as the Cray brothers did. Fortunately, I wasn't locked up. I was a tourist at that point in time. Anyway, we have a great time. i got to tell you the end of this. And um, we're ready to check out. It's like 2 p.m., you know, on a certain day after a couple of days that we were there. And we come down. Uh, they had taken our luggage down. We come into the lobby, and there's the hotel manager and all the staff there to greet me. And I said, man, what is this? And the manager says, Mr. Francis, it's really an honor to meet you. And, you know, we were so happy that you stayed at our hotel. And, you know, we knew who you were. We didn't want to disturb. You know, they're very respectful. They don't, you know, they're very respectful in, in, in English, very proper, I would say. And uh, they had copies of my books. They wanted me to sign it. They said, anytime you come back here. So I was wondering why they treated us so well. I mean, it's a great hotel anyhow, but uh, it was just a great overall experience. I happen to love London. I happen to love the United Kingdom. People are great. And, you know, my experiences there have been wonderful. Hope to be back there this year when I speak in Denmark. We're also going to the United Kingdom. So that's kind of my connection to the craze. We were in the same jail cell together. So... That's it for that, okay? Let me wrap up really quick. Um, MichaelFrancis.com, my community, my crew, 13,000 members encouraging one another all the time. We always provide great content. All is going good. Again, Blood Covenant, the book is back in stock. Yes, I'll sign it for you. I'll tell you right now, you can buy it cheaper on Amazon. If you want my signature, if that means anything to you, I sign it personally, no stamp. And yes, but get it anywhere you want. I just wanted to let you know that it's, uh, it's available. And... Um, Subscribers, we're getting close. I think we're almost up to 450,000, thanks to all of you. You have a lot of content on YouTube. I appreciate you looking into mine. Thank you very much. We had a big giveaway at 250,000. We're going to have a bigger giveaway at 500,000. I promise you, it's going to be great prizes as soon as we reach it. We're getting there, maybe another month or so, depending upon all of you. If you like the content, please subscribe. You get alerts. You'll get you know a little bit more information out of us. So that's it. I thank you all very, very much for tuning in. Appreciate it very much. I get asked about Sammy. We're in negotiation. That's all I'm going to tell you. May happen, maybe not, maybe so. Stay tuned, you'll find out. How do I always leave you? Be safe, be healthy, God bless, and I will see you next time.